you very much. I am given the heavy responsibility of exciting you about informed discourse on a Saturday morning. Okay? <laughs> and so for that, I deliberately chose a provocative title, How the West and Beijing Got China Wrong. Now, the title of my talk comes straight out of this issue from The Economist, which was published in 2017, How the West Got China Wrong. It was published after Chinese President Xi Jinping and the term limits, and this was a time of great anxiety in the West. Okay? So in this particular issue, it makes the following observations. Uh, it argues, or it states the fact, that China has prospered economically without political reforms. And therefore, this gives everyone around the world a great deal of fear that the so-called China model proves that autocracy is better than democracy in promoting growth, which makes everyone feel worried that this is undermining the appeal of democracy. And therefore, the recommendation of this article is that the Western nations should band together and counter China's power, right? And so discourse like this is what you, I think, read very often in the media these days. Uh, but having read this article carefully several times, in my opinion, I don't think it actually tells us how the West got China wrong. Right? It doesn't actually explain to us the nature of the misunderstanding. And so in my humble opinion as a reader, I think the real title of the magazine should have been The West Got China Wrong, exclamation mark, <laughs> emoji worried. Right? <laughs> That's what it's really saying. So today, I would like to share with you my take on how the West got China wrong. And I'm going to present three points to you. Um, if you want to read about it in detail, you can find it in this essay that I wrote in Foreign Affairs for the issue on Is Democracy Dying? Uh, my essay was titled, Autocracy of Chinese Characteristics, Beijing's Behind the Scenes Reforms. And I'm not going into the details of this essay because of time limitations, but I'm just going to give you a rough sketch of three main points about how the West got China wrong. So let me begin. So part one, how did the West got China wrong? Well, popular wisdom assumes that China carried out economic reforms without political reforms. Now, that seems obvious enough, because under Mao, China was a single-party autocracy. Today, China is still a single-party autocracy. So obviously, China did not carry out any political reforms. That seems obvious to everyone, right? But what I'm going to explain to you today is that, in fact, reform-era China has already pursued significant political reforms, just not in the manner that Western observers expected. So this is what we are going to learn about today. And how did they do so? They did so by substituting political reforms with bureaucratic reforms. Okay? Now, this is the part where it gets a little bit challenging, particularly on a Saturday morning, when you bring up the topic of bureaucracy, immediately that is sleep-inducing, <laughs> right? Like, who wants to hear about the bureaucracy? We want to hear something more exciting. So why do we need to understand bureaucratic reforms in order to understand China's governance and economic reforms? And so this is a very simple point that everyone needs to understand which is that in the United States, politics are exciting and bureaucracy is boring. In China, the opposite is true. Right? So if we look at American politics, and I chose this photo because it was just a classic illustration of what we see in American politics. Right? 
people fighting all the time, scandals, making fun of the president, and all kinds of ridiculous things happening every single day. When people fight, it's all out in the open. So politics is really exciting, even though we fight about it. But the moment you talk about bureaucracy, civil service in America, nobody ever likes to talk about it because it's so predictable. It's so reliable, right? Nobody wants to talk about the DMV. The DMV only appears in The Simpsons, right? <laughs> and then, but when you turn to China, you get the opposite. Now, when you have these like major party meetings in China, the plenums and the congresses, it's always scripted and orchestrated. Right? The great leader makes a speech for two hours. Everyone sits in the back, back very straight. They smile, clap at regular intervals. Right? And then it all ends. And then it gives everyone the impression, wow, the party really has everything together. And the great leader just needs to make a speech, and everyone falls in line. That's the impression that you get in an official meeting where, pol where politics is boring. But the exciting part of Chinese politics happens before and after the meeting. And it happens below the surface of Beijing, in all of the places that you will never see and you don't read about in the newspaper. It happens in the bureaucracy. So this is a snapshot from a great movie, highly recommended. It's a documentary about a party secretary in local government. And you can see this is a regular scene in bureaucratic politics, whining, dining, banqueting, negotiating, doing grove corruption, all kinds of things, all happening at the same time under the table, and that's where the excitement is, right? And so if you want to understand Chinese politics, you can't just look at what you see on TV and in the media. You need to look below the surface, and you need to understand bureaucratic politics. So here's one of the, another fact that is essential to know. Um, how big is China's bureaucracy? And when I say the bureaucracy, I mean the civil service, the party and the state offices, as well as public service providers. Okay? Now it's useful to bear in mind that China's bureaucracy is massive. It has 50 million personnel altogether. This does not include state-owned enterprises and the military. Now, to put things in context, um, what is Maine's population? <laughs> it's 1.3 million. All right? So China's bureaucracy is actually the size of the population of South Korea. Managing a bureaucracy of this size is like managing a country. Right? And so when you are the leader of China and you want to implement any vision, any policy, you need to think about this massive bureaucracy of 50 million. How do you mobilize them? How do you incentivize them? How do you monitor them? How do you get them to work with you? Right? So this is where all the politics is in China. In China. All right, and so what happened when Deng came to power for sure, Deng rejected Western-style democracy. He was very clear that China was not going to imitate the US. They were going to have their own political system. But nevertheless, it doesn't mean that he did not reform politics. He reformed politics by changing the bureaucracy. And he introduced a variety of reforms at both the highest level of the bureaucracy down to the street level regular bureaucrats who interact directly with citizens. Specifically, all of the reforms that he introduced serve to bring about three important qualities. Partial limits on power, accountability, and competition. And just to give you some examples on partial limits on power, Deng introduced the norm of shifting from one-man rule under Mao to a norm of collective leadership. He also introduced term limits into the Constitution. Uh, he rejected the personality cult, 
So you almost never see Deng statues anywhere in China, right? And he also introduced the norm of mandatory retirement. So all of these institutions and reforms that you don't normally hear about are actually very important because they place partial limits on power. He also introduced accountability and competition, but without elections. So how did he do that? He changed the report cards of local officials throughout China, of which, remember again, there are tens of millions of them. Right? So under Mao, people were promoted for their loyalty, for you know, how enthusiastically they praised the supreme leader. But under them, he was a very practical man. And he decided that we were going to have report cards, and we are going to evaluate and reward you based on your ability to produce concrete economic results. So he changed the report cards, and they publicized the results of these rankings, how you rank vis-a-vis -vis your peers. And this generated a tremendous amount of competition within the party to perform well. So without having elections, he was able to increase accountability and competition. So if you think about the three characteristics that I talked about, accountability, competition, partial limits on power, any person who comes from a democratic society would know, I know these qualities. That's what you're supposed to get in a democracy. So to the extent, we might say that these three qualities can be called democratic characteristics, regardless of where they manifest. However, these three characteristics do not make up what we conventionally understand as democracy. Because when we talk about democracy, there are also other characteristics that we consider to be indispensable, including formal checks and balances, competitive elections, and a free press. Right? And so in China, what happened in the reform era is that they adopted some democratic characteristics, and they put it into the civil service, into the bureaucracy. But at the same time, they rejected other qualities of, the, of, of what we normally think of as a democracy. So when you understand the kind of reforms that they put together, what we might say is that although bureaucratic reforms in the reform era appear dry and apolitical, they have in fact created a unique hybrid. I'm going to call this autocracy with democratic characteristics. Okay? So it's a little bit of a paradoxical concept. But if you understand, if you unbundle the qualities of democracy, you see that even in a single party system, you can incorporate democratic uh, qualities. So this was in fact, I argue, the political foundation of China's economic success and dynamism. It wasn't autocracy alone that made China great, because China was an autocracy for a long time, including under Mao and it wasn't great under Mao. So something must have changed in the political system, even though they did not introduce elections. And this change, I argue, is the introduction of democratic characteristics into an autocratic political system. Now, here's the twist, because you might notice that I very carefully defined the reform era as the period from 1978 when markets open to 2012. What happened in 2012 is that China had a new leader, Chinese President Xi Jinping. And what I argue is that bureaucratic reforms cannot substitute for political reforms forever. Because as China transitions from a simple industrial economy to an innovation-led knowledge economy, you do need political freedoms. You need free flow of information. You need civil society to be able to create those ideas for continued economic growth. And yet, just as political freedoms have become imperative for continued economic growth, what we have seen in the past few years, unfortunately, is a backpedaling 
of many of the democratic qualities that the reformist leadership under Deng Xiaoping had introduced back in 1978. So I'm going to bracket this point, and we can come back to it during the Q&A. But I now want to move on to the second point about how the West got China wrong. Now, if we understand my previous point, you see what I'm going to get at here. The popular wisdom is the fear that the so-called China model proves that autocracy is better than democracy. This misunderstanding is based on a wrong understanding of what the China model is. Right? People assume they know what the China model is, namely that it is simply just autocracy. And this misunderstanding is held up and advanced with a great deal of confidence. Right? And so you have this widespread misunderstanding out there that oh, with, oh, the China model is basically just authoritarian governance, and so we should be very fearful of China's uh, success. But if we understand, if we look at the facts and understand the history, we will un realize that what China really shows us is that even a single party autocracy requires democratic characteristics especially accountability, competition, and limits on power in order to thrive economically and socially. So China's experience and China's success actually shows that everyone needs a dose of democracy. But that dose of democracy will have to be fitted to local and national conditions. It doesn't have to come in an American form. All right, that is the distinction that we need to make. And Deng himself understands this principle very well. And in order to show that, I'd like to give everyone a little historical perspective. This is the speech that Deng made in December 1978. This is the historic speech that he made at the highest level of the party, just as the country was trying to recover from the damage and the ravages of the Cultural Revolution, and he was trying to define a new vision for the country. This was the speech that launched the famous reform era. Okay? Now, in the speech, I'm going to ask you to guess. Um, how many times do you think he mentioned the word infrastructure? Now, if you look at China's development today, it's very clear that it is so centered on infrastructure, right? Everywhere in China, there is constant building. And the Belt and Road Project is basically a massive infrastructure project. So infrastructure is obviously so critical to China's development. So how many times do you think Deng mentioned infrastructure in this speech? And I encourage you to shout out your answer, all right? It's better than coffee, I guarantee you that. So how many times? You guys are no fun. You're supposed to say 10. All right? I think I gave it away. I should, have, I should have tried to trick you more. All right? You're absolutely right. It's zero. He never once mentioned infrastructure. Okay? And then investment. He mentioned it once in reference to foreign investment. All right, just, so this by itself already is telling you something, that the work of reform and opening is not primarily economic. It's primarily political. The political problem was a lot harder than the economic problem. And so he spent his time talking about politics. So how many times do you think he mentioned party leadership? All right, guess again. Shout out your answer. Uh, this time, this time is hard to tell, right? Yes. 27. 47? Anyone else? Three? Very good. You came closest. Party leadership. Four times. He mentioned it in his speech. Four times. Accountability. Twelve times. Liberate or liberalize 19 times. And then finally, democracy, 
22 times. All right, so I think this is an aspect of Chinese recent history that we forgot or that we've never realized. But Deng understood the problems of concentrating power on one person and on not having accountability and honesty and competition. He knew it was very important to put these qualities into the bureaucracy in order to move forward and in order to be economically dynamic. Okay? And so that takes us to point number three. This is a much more fundamental fallacy that the West has about China. It is a conceptual fallacy. It is this insistence that countries are either a democracy or an autocracy. Either you look like the United States or something is wrong with you. <laughs> okay? And so in academic language, we call that a false binary, a false binary. Now it's a bit of a chunky word, and so to make sure that everyone understands a false binary completely clearly, let me give you an example from a movie that I watch on the plane. It's called The Spy Who Dumped Me. <laughs> it's a really good example. When I saw it, I was like, ah, I'm going to use that to teach about false binary. Um, so, so Kate McKinnon is one of the spies. And there was this moment when she said, do you want to die having never been to Europe or to go to Europe and die having been to Europe? <laughs> All right? And then the other spy, played by Mila Kunis, says, why are those my only two options? <laughs> exactly. Why? Why? Right? And this is funny in the context of a comedy. It's not so funny in the context of national and foreign analysis. Right? But if you think about how we understand regime types, we only have two options, democracy or autocracy. When you have a false binary, that leads to a lot of problems. That leads to mislabeling of countries. For example, if you only have two categories, it means that this category, autocracy, includes North Korea, Cuba, Soviet Union, Mao era China, and Deng era China. As long as you are not a Western style democracy and you don't look like the United States, you belong in the enemy camp. Right? That's very misleading because if you know anything about China at all, Mao era China and Deng era China and even Xi era China are three very different Chinas. Right? And to put them all and lump them all in one category results in a great deal of confusion. Right? Another type of confusion that results from having a false binary is some people arguing that, oh, look at the problems that democracies are having today. You know, given that democracies have so many problems, let's go for autocracy. And again, I would bring in the quote from Mila Kunis, why are those my only two options, right? If something is wrong with your democracy, fix the democracy, right? You don't have to adopt autocracy as the only other option. So this is kind of a third point that I'd like to bring in, a little bit of a twist here. What I would also like to suggest is that this false binary that I was talking about is not a fallacy that is unique to the West. Beijing also gets China wrong to the extent that this false binary of either democracy or autocracy is also popular in China today. Now, I want to sort of qualify my use of the term Beijing. It's an unfortunate shorthand for what is, in fact, a highly heterogeneous group of people, everything from very conservative to very liberal. Right? So when I say Beijing, I'm just using it as a shorthand for sort of the popular opinions in China today, what you might read in the state newspaper, in media commentaries, and some of the senior analysts I spoke with in Beijing. Um, many people also believe in China that countries are either democracy or autocracy. So given the clear classification that China is not a democracy, 
there are many people in China today who believe, oh, it was autocracy whom that made China great, and therefore we should continue being an autocracy. And what they have forgotten, I argue, is that if they just look back at their recent history, the political foundation of their economic success was actually autocracy with democratic characteristics. And those democratic characteristics are essential for China to preserve and indeed to expand in order to have continued economic development. So a recap of how the West got China wrong. Okay, three points. First, it is wrong to assume that China had reformed economically without political reforms because, in fact, China already had political reforms in the form of bureaucratic reforms. Point number two, it is also wrong to believe that China proves that autocracy is superior to democracy. No, China proves that even a single party autocracy needs democratic characteristics in order to mitigate some of the fatal problems of autocracy, in order to unleash people's creativity, in order to be economically dynamic. And number three, it is wrong to subscribe to a false binary, whether in the West or in China, we should not just think of countries as either a democracy or an autocracy because there are many mixtures in between. Some autocracies can have democratic qualities, and bear in mind, some democracies can have illiberal qualities as well. Right? Both of these hybrids can exist, and we need to change our concepts so that we can process these realities out there that do not fit the false binary that is now popular. And this is my ending message. I think this is what everyone needs to understand, regardless of Americans or Chinese or anyone from any other part of the world, which is that China's strength lies not in brute power, but in its flexibility. So sometimes China, every now and then, would exercise brute power. But whenever it does that, it almost always backfire. Right? So China is at its strongest when it is adaptive and flexible and decentralized and listens to people. And so this quality of strength as flexibility is sort of like water. And this idea is actually intrinsic in much of Chinese culture and philosophy. Lao Tzu has said the same. Bruce Lee said the same too. <laughs> right? So if the Chinese government really values Chinese philosophy and culture, then they should heed the wisdom of Chinese philosophy, which says that strength is not about brute power, but it's about flexibility. And I would also add that this same statement applies just as well to the United States. America's strength lies not in brute power, but in its flexibility. Sometimes, America applies brute power domestically and in its treatment of other countries abroad. And when that happens, it never ends well, <laughs> right? And so I think that is very useful for all of us, regardless of cultures, to bear this in mind. This morning, I was just wondering, would it be possible for me to have a prop for water to reinforce my message? And you can't believe my luck. <laughs> so, if you forget everything that I've said, that's all right. In the rest of the day, whenever you take a sip of water, just remember that strength is not about brute power, but it's about flexibility, and that this is a truth that applies not only to China, but also to America. Cheers. Yeah.